All right, I'm going to mute you guys and we'll say welcome to everyone that is uh, on um, Facebook. I think we're live here, so uh, we will go ahead and get started. We um, are talking today about um, the second chapter of Revelation, and we're going to start with the church that Jesus first addresses, which is the church at Ephesus or the Ephesians. So before we get started, as always, we got to take the time to ask God's guidance and wisdom in everything we do. So let's go ahead and say a prayer, and then we'll get started. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for another day. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that he died on the cross for us. We pray that you would just help us to be good witnesses for him, and that we might reflect his word accurately, and that you would guide our direction and our discussion and those who would view it, Lord, we just pray that you would um, have your blessing upon them because you promised a blessing, Lord, to any who would hear these words or read these words and keep those things which are in them, Lord, because the time is at hand. And we just pray that uh, that blessing would fall on us. And we just pray that you would open our hearts to your word and open the eyes of our understanding. Thank you more than anything else for your son, Jesus Christ, paying for our sins. And what a wonderful gift that was. It's in your son's precious name we pray these things. And amen. All right. Well, welcome, folks. It's good to see everybody. Um, I'm going to try to have the comments open on Facebook Live so that I can also see if anybody has any comments there. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So the letters to the churches, these are events that happen. So whenever before we talked about how John was at the island of Patmos, he was in exile. He was outside and there was Really, he was there because he was preaching the word of God, and he couldn't leave until that emperor died, the emperor Domitian. Um, and he's there on this day of the Lord, on the Lord's day, and he's, he's meditating, he's praying to God. He was in the spirit, the Bible tells us, and he has this vision where Jesus speaks from behind him. He turns around and sees this glorified Jesus Christ, and this glorified Jesus Christ is standing behind him in the midst of seven candlesticks, holding seven stars, sword out of his mouth, eyes of fire, feet that looked like brass, um, voice that sounded like a trumpet and many waters, um, like the Niagara Falls, as I like to think of it. So the point being, he sees this amazing view, and then Jesus makes a statement. He says, listen, I want you to write down what you just saw, the things you just saw and heard. Write those down, the things which you have seen. And then he says, then I want you to write the things that are the things that are currently going on. And then he says, I want you to write the things which shall be hereafter, meaning after the things that are. So right now, we're going to see the things that are. So there were seven churches that Jesus addressed. And the real question is, why did he address these seven churches? We know that Paul addresses seven churches, but Jesus and Paul only have one church that overlaps. All the other churches were different cities they were in. And by the way, when we talk about churches, we're talking about meetings in homes. We're not talking about formal church meetings, formal uh, buildings with choirs and all the things we think of. We're thinking about groups of Christians meeting together in a home and their children. And then as they would grow, they would grow and maybe make a second church and a third church and spread the word because that's the job of Christians is to go and disciple and preach the name uh, the salvation of Jesus Christ, the good news, the gospel, to make more Christians. But Jesus talked about these seven churches as the seven churches. And as you're going to see here soon, at the end of every letter, he says, let he, um, <clears throat> he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That means that the things that he is going to tell us in these letters to the churches is meant for all churches, all Christians, all people who claim to accept Jesus as their Savior and claim to be born again believers. Get them off. Um, so now, why do I say those who claim? Because just like today, even back then, churches were made up of true believers and people who claim to be believers. And that's exactly what Jesus taught. If you remember back, there was a parable where Jesus talks about a seed that's sown by the sower, and some of the seed falls on rocky ground, 
Some of the seed falls on the path. Some of the seed falls among thorns and some of the seed falls in the good ground. Everyone can hear the word of God. Some utterly reject it. The birds come and eat it. Some think they accept it. They say, that sounds good. I'll believe that. But as soon as struggle or problems arise, they throw it off. These people would at any point in their lives, they'll say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. But as soon as bad things happen, as soon as it doesn't seem that God's doing things their way, or they seem like they're suffering in this world, well, then they throw it off. So there are many people, according to Jesus, who call themselves Christian, who are not really saved. And that's going to become an issue in these churches as well. And then there's, of course, those who are truly saved, some of which care so much about the things of this world, they never produce fruit. We tend to call them carnal or worldly Christians. And then there are those who are very spiritual, and they go and they focus their entire lives on how to please the Lord. And they produce fruit. Sometimes we see it, sometimes we don't. But we see there's a different, different um, people who claim to be Christians, some of which have never taken root in their own heart. So the lessons are for everyone. The lessons for each church are for everyone. If you have an ear to hear, you need to hear what he says to the churches. You need to learn from what he's teaching them. Um, every single church that takes the name of Christ, that calls itself a Christian, fits one part of this or multiple parts of it. You personally may fit this particular church we're going to talk about today, or you may fit a suffering church, depending on where you are in the world or the type of persecution you face. There are seven churches, and they will define, if not completely, at least in part, every Christian and every current church, or I won't, I won't go so broadly as to say denomination, but that's the idea, that even certain denominations. Your family, you know, might hate, hate and ridicule you, and you may be part of the suffering church, but we're going to take a look at each one individually. And then the last thing, of course, we have to understand these churches, as Jesus called them, the seven churches, we're going to see that it's prophetic. We're going to see that these are written in an order that tells us the history of the world from a Christian perspective. We're going to see it from the time of the apostles all the way till the time of today. And we're going to see how that fits. And how do I know for a fact, not just a speculation, how do I know for a fact that this is prophetic? Because to some of the churches, now these physical churches are all gone. The cities they were in, most of them are gone and buried. Most of this part of the world is now a Muslim nation. But Jesus says that to these churches, they will be there when he returns. So I know for a fact that these have a prophetic application, not just to the physical church, but to those who line up with how these churches are described. So Again, remember, not everyone who claims to be a Christian is saved. That will make clear up a lot of what's going on here. So we're going to go through these seven churches. The first one is called Ephesus, and that's the one we're going to focus on today. And that was the church of the apostles. That was the church up into the 100, early 100 to 200 A.D., then you're going to see the church of Smyrna, which kind of overlapped a little with Ephesus. And Smyrna is going to represent the persecuted church. This is the church where you hear the stories about people being fed to lions and people being lit, on, lit as torches, being doused in oil, lit as torches uh, by these evil emperors of Rome. And the Christians are always the target. And that's going to be the persecuted church, which we'll talk about. And that happened for a period of time between about 100 AD and 300-ish AD. And then you're going to hear about Pergamos. This is the church um, where Constantine, and uh, he made it not illegal to be a Christian. And he also made it financially advantageous to be a Christian. So the church was filled with people who claimed Christianity. So you're going to see this worldly church. And then you're going to see the medieval church. That's going to be what we today might call a Roman Catholic or Greek Orthodox or the many denominations of Catholics and Orthodox that are out there. Um, then you're going to see the Church of the Reformation, the Church of Sardis, as we call it. That's going to be what we uh, would call the um, Protestant church, even though that's kind of a broad term. But the Protestant church, meaning all the current denominations we see of the non 
uh, traditional churches, the non-Orthodox, non-Catholic churches. And we're going to see God has some good things to say about each of these churches and some bad things. But living right alongside these other two churches, you're going to see a church called Philadelphia, which we know the church is the city of brotherly love, right? That's the American Philadelphia. Well, the same thing applies to the original Philadelphia in Asia. And then finally, we're going to see the church of Laodicea, the church of, I'll just call it, everything goes. And we're going to see where do these churches, where do they shine and where do they fail? And realize that every one of these seven churches is surprised by their report card, because that's exactly what we're seeing here. We're seeing a report card. Here's your strengths. Here's your weaknesses. Here's where you need to improve. And here's the punishment if you don't improve. We need to see things from Jesus's perspective. And that's what's kind of is going to lead us in now as we get started with the first church of these seven. And this is the church at Ephesus. So here we go. So this is Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, and walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now we're going to go ahead and read the whole letter to this church. It's only a few verses. So uh, we'll go on to verse 2. So he says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, this is Jesus Christ talking to him. Remember, therefore, from whence you are fallen, thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick from out of this place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. All right, so let's break this first letter down. And I hope that you've already read all of Revelation 2 and 3. And the idea is you want to see the contrast in what he says and in the order he says them in. But let's just break down today the church of Ephesus. So let's read verse 1 again. It says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now remember, the book of Revelation is encoded. We know what the seven stars are. They're the leaders, spiritually or physically, the leaders of these churches. And we also look at the seven golden candlesticks that are the seven churches. That was decoded at the end of chapter one. We don't have to guess at what that means. So now we got to think, what else can we learn from just this verse? Well, the first thing is, what does the name Ephesus mean? Ephesus means my desired one, my darling, or my one and only. This is the church of the apostles. The first church that was written to was this church of Ephesus. Ephesus was a huge, amazing city. It was the capital of Asia Minor. So when the Roman Empire had different areas. So Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire, but there were territories, almost like states or counties. And one of those states was Asia Minor, or what we might consider um, the uh, eastern side of Turkey. And so Ephesus was this capital, and it was actually called the Queen of Asia, or the Light of Asia. And unfortunately, it was also the capital of idolatry. It was one of the largest cities in the world. And when I say idolatry, I mean like idol worship, worshiping false gods. There were roads that lead to a bunch of other cities that had churches mentioned in the Bible, like Laodicea, which we're going to read about. That's the seventh church. Sardis, which is the fifth church. Um, Galatia, which Paul wrote to the Galatians. Colossae, which Paul wrote to in the Colossians. And of course, there were roads leading back to Rome, because at that time, as we say, all roads led to Rome. And of course, we know Paul also wrote to the church at Rome, the Romans. This city was founded in 1400 B.C. And one of the things they had there was this temple 
to what they to what the Hittites called this fertility goddess, the mother goddess. She's the goddess of motherhood. So this ancient Hittite fertility goddess was there. But as the Greeks came through, they renamed her Artemis and they made a temple to Artemis. And of course, when the Romans came through, she was renamed Diana. Because if you know anything about Roman mythology and Greek mythology, they essentially have very similar gods that generally go by different names. All these uh, the false deities of the Romans and the Greeks. So in the Bible, when you're reading the book of Acts, you're going to come across the missionary trips of the apostles, including, of course, the apostle Paul. And Acts 19 talks about how Paul actually is going through there, and this goddess Diana is being worshipped, and people are selling her images and all these different uh, uh, mystical things to worship her with. And she had a temple there, which we think about temples in the ancient world. In Lebanon, there's a massive temple called Baalbek. Um, in uh, Rome, there's a place called the Parthenon, huge. The temple to Diana dwarfed these other ones. It was huge. It was massive. It's much larger than the Parthenon. That temple drew a lot of money. They had prostitution there where you would go and as part of your fertility goddess offerings, there were prostitutes. Um, there was also, of course, all kinds of religious artifacts that you could buy there to worship this false goddess. Um, and there's also some people that accepted Christ out of this group. <clears throat> so there were these two devoted believers we read about called Priscilla and Aquila. We have Apollos and Paul who also go there. We know that the Apollos and Paul, they actually get into a fight with the leaders of that town because of they, them wanting to worship uh, Diana and them preaching to them of the true God, Jesus Christ. So the people of that city, they hated Christians. And the Christian they hated most of all was Paul. He was really putting a dent in their market. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so he preached against this false deity. We know that John, the person writing this, actually lived in Ephesus for a period of time. And essentially, that great city through the course of time originally was this massive center of everything. But as its seaport began to dwindle because of erosion, all of the traffic actually moved over to Smyrna, and you actually lose a lot of its importance. It becomes just a village that doesn't have its former glory. And you can actually see that in a lot of American cities that at one point were booming, and then over time they deteriorate, and not enough effort is put in maintaining them, and things just kind of dwindle away. So we see when Paul writes a letter to the Ephesians, he talks, he addresses the believers that are in the Ephesians. He calls them the saints. So anytime you see the word saint in the Bible, to be a saint means that you have accepted Jesus as your Savior. Because at that moment, you are perfected. You are made perfect spiritually. You become like Jesus because everything that was on your account that was against you was put on Jesus Christ. So praise God, we are all saints. And the Bible tells us we are all kings and we will reign with him if you've accepted him. So we see that the, when Paul wrote, he wrote to the saints. So we know that we can take that information and apply it to us. But we see here that it's not just addressed to the believers, but it's addressed to the leader of the church, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? So it's addressed to the angel, which was going to include both those who are believers and those who are believers by name only, who have never truly accepted Jesus in their heart. So Paul, whenever he was making his trip through, I know we're going through a lot of history here, but it's all part of, part of the story. When he goes through uh, his missionary journey, and he's on his way back to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, he had wanted to come to Ephesus. He had wanted to talk to him, but he didn't have time. So he went to a nearby city called uh, Miletus or Miletus, and he actually sends, it's about 20, 30 miles away, he sends for the elders of the Ephesians, and they have to make this trip. Remember, there's no cars then, it's a big trip. Um, so he may, they come down and he wants to talk with them because he's particularly worried about the Ephesians. He reminds them how he taught them, how he warned them, how despite the trouble he had, he went out of his way and went house to house to the different house churches there. And he essentially tells them that there's going to be false teachers that are going to come in and try to corrupt his doctrine. There's going to be false teachers who teach things that are not from Jesus. And these elders, they take the words to heart. They succeed in making sure they keep the doctrine of the apostles. 
and particularly Paul, because he was the apostle to the Gentiles. He talks about these evil teachers, and Jesus actually had warned about how there's going to be grievous wolves that enter among you in sheep's clothing. We use that term still today, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And he tells them that this is going to happen, and we see that Paul says the same thing in Acts chapter 20, verse 30 to 38. Not only did Paul, but the author of this book, the book of Revelation, John actually writes to the Ephesians in 1 John, and he again warns them, particularly in chapter 4, that there's going to be a whole lot of false teaching, false doctrine. you got to be on your, on your uh, guard against it. And they did a really, really good job may, protecting the doctrine. And in 2 John, which many people, including myself, believe that this is likely a letter to Mary, the mother of Christ, who was the adopted mother of John, because at the cross, Jesus asked Mary to adopt John as her son and asked John to adopt Mary as his mother, because even though he had brothers and sisters, Jesus wanted John and her to have a very special relationship. And it seems that in 2 John, we see it. And he actually warns Mary that there's going to be false teachers. Make sure you don't give them any manner of, um, you don't condone their teachings or you don't uh, validate their teachings in any way. And that's in verse 7 to 11. Now, it's not clear that that letter, second John is to Mary, but that's what people, a lot of people tend to think. All right. So then we see how Jesus introduced himself to this church. How did he talk to these Ephesians? He says, these same things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand and walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So he's letting this church know all of your leadership, everything are in my hand, and I am walking among you. Even though we, he's walking among us, we are in his hand. Everything's in his hand. Everything is under his control. We like to think that we're in control. We like to think that we can do anything we want to do. And it is true. Man is given free will. The free will to accept Jesus Christ, the free will to reject Jesus Christ. But the fact is that if you've accepted Jesus Christ, you were purchased. You belong to him. And we become his children. And he can discipline us. He can correct us. And he can also guide us and show us in love and in um, discipline how he wants us to be. He can mold us because he's the potter. We're the clay. That's just how it is if you've accepted him as your savior. But even when people did not accept him, Back when Jesus walked the earth, he still was always in control. When they wanted to make him king, he just disappeared. He went through them, and they never, they never could catch him. When they wanted to kill him, he decided the time when it was going to happen. He came to Jerusalem, and they were wanting to kill him, but they didn't want to capture him on a feast day. Well, he goes and has the Passover supper with his disciples, and then afterwards he tells Judah, or Judas, he says, hey, Judas, it's, uh, it's time. Go, go and do what you got to do. He actually chose when it was time for him to be betrayed. A lot of people forget that. Whenever um, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and all these uh, soldiers show up, and these soldiers say, hey, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I'm he. And they all fall backwards. And he says, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus he says, I told you I'm he. Let these people go. I'm right here. He's commanding the soldiers who are coming to arrest him. He's always in control. They were terrified of him, of his power, the power of his voice as a man. It's going to be that much more terrifying for those who are against him when he comes back glorified and he is coming back. When he's on the cross, he was also in full control when he, of when he died. Crucifixion is one of the rare forms of execution where someone else doesn't have control of when you die. If you're getting beheaded, you're going to die when you die. If you're getting shot, you're going to die when, you, when they choose to pull the trigger. But when you're on the cross, you die when you give up. And most people would stay alive for days. But Jesus Christ, he decided, he said, okay, it's finished. Then he gave up the ghost. He was always in control. He said, I lay down my life and I take it back again. He's always been in absolute control. Crucifixion of Jesus Christ was a victory. It was planned. 
It was what he came to do to save me and to save you. So he's always in control. He's walking in the midst. He sees everything about us. There's nothing that you do that he doesn't know. Nothing that you think that he doesn't know. And you can trust him. He loves you so much that he can't take his eyes off you. So then we go on to verse 2. He's telling this church of what they've done, what he's seen them do, and what, what is good about it. He says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and thou how and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my, my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. So he gives them seven great things that they've done. He makes it clear that all the churches are subject to them, and he notices everything, no matter how subtle it is. He knows their works, the good and the bad. He knows they're active. He knows that they were working and patient. They didn't just accept new teachings as fact, but instead they went and made sure that all teaching was from God before they would accept it. It says they would try those who are apostles and are not. So when somebody would come and say, oh, you know, God's told me this. Well, they would look at the Bible and they would say, wait a minute, you're trying to use your tradition, but that contradicts what Jesus said. So they would reject those false teachings. Now, sadly, and I hope I'm not talking about anyone's church here, but sadly, a lot of Christians have gotten into the habit of sorely trusting or completely trusting their pastor, their Bible study leader, their Sunday school teacher, the TV preacher, as what they saying must be true, what they're saying must be true. You should absolutely have respect and prayer and focus your attention on these teachers, but you should always be reading your Bible. You should always be looking and searching the scriptures to see whether these things be so. These people tried those who were apostles and were not, and they were liars, and they found out they were able to differentiate true doctrine from false doctrine, and that's something every Christian ought to do, and how do we do it? Well, we don't have to go and necessarily, if I go to church and the church tells me one thing, well, the Bible says that the scripture is, is um, useful to reprove and to correct and to teach, so the fact is we can use the word of God to know whether what someone says is true. And that's what we all ought to be doing, no matter what church you attend. Because sometimes I can make mistakes, pastors can make mistakes, priests, uh, you name it. We ever, No one is infallible but Jesus Christ. So um, they didn't just accept these new teachings. So we need to make sure that we don't fall for wolves in sheep's clothing. I know it's a disheartening thing to think about, but some church leaders are not Christian. Not everyone who claims the role of pastor, priest, uh, bishop, you name it, whatever the leadership of your church is, is necessarily saved. The Bible tells us so. The Bible tells us that there were many who abandoned the faith, who, who said they were believers, but they never were. And John tells us it's because they were never saved. He tells us that they went out from us because they were not of us, but they left just to prove that they were never one of us. So the point is, don't take anything for granted. Don't take what I say for granted. Look at the Bible. Read what I'm reading. Look up the cross references. See if it matches what the Bible teaches. So what does he tell these folks in the good way? He says, I know your works. They worked hard. They did a good job. They didn't let any false doctrine into the church. And then he tells them in verse three, you have borne or you've, you've, you've carried burdens. You have patience for my namesake. You have worked or labored and you haven't fainted. This church, remember, Ephesus hated Christians because they didn't like them taking away from their business. Because when someone became a Christian, there's no more money to be made off of them. Christianity, if the true Christianity, I should say, is a faith that takes nothing. It gives everything. Every major hospital on the planet, at least historically, was started by a church. Catholics, Baptists, um, evangelicals of different types, there's been um, uh, 
Episcopalian churches. There's been all kinds of denominations. Every hospital was a free outreach. Schools, all the major universities were free, done by the church in the past until the rest of the world got involved and took over. Now it's all about finances. But churches have always been the source of welfare to the world, the source of charity, the source of health care. Churches have always been hard workers. But whenever the rest of the world sees there's no money to be made or it's damaging them, well, guess what? These folks who were peddling their false god, Diana, to try and make money, well, once these people became believers, there was no more, give us your money. A true Christian church never is insistent on your money. You absolutely should give money to God, and many times that's through the church. You should give what God prospers you to the church, and some people say 10%. I believe it's whatever you feel God has laid on your heart, and it doesn't always have to be necessarily in the offering plate, although if you're being fed at your church spiritually, if you're receiving blessing from your church, you absolutely ought to support that so other people can receive it too, and the Bible's clear that those who are teaching, those who are uh, leading you at your church, they also are worthy of their pay. They're worthy of their hire. They're doing work for God, and the people of God should support them. But the point is, whenever Christianity, whenever, and I've heard people on TV tell you, hey, send us this much money, and God's going to bless you this much. That is absolutely not biblical teaching. That's not how Christianity works. That's not how God works. It's not, okay, you give me this much, you'll get that much. You double it, I'm going to give you quadruple. That's not how it works. You trust the Lord, you give him as you're led to do, and you trust in him no matter what you have in the bank. You trust in him no matter where you are, and you trust for him to fill you your needs. So this church, again, they wholeheartedly served God. And he told them these seven good things. And remember, we already talked how Paul had warned these people you got to be very careful against these false teachers. John had warned these people, you got to be very careful against false teachers. Well, they were doing it, and they were doing it really well. So much so that we see now they have a problem in verse 4. He says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. So God has something against thee. Um, we'll get to that in just a second, Matt. He was asking about the tree of life. Is it the same tree of life in the Garden of Eden? We're going to get to that here in a few verses. So, uh, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Why? Because you've left your first love. This is a very sad reality for many Christians. They get so interested in serving and doing things and doing stuff for church, for God, for outreach, that they forget about the relationship they're supposed to have with their Savior. So if I went all day for my wife, who I love dearly, if I went all day to work, if I work 14 hours a day, and I want to go and I want to buy her nice things, and then when I come home, she's already asleep, so I make sure that I clean up the house so she wakes up to a clean house. And the next morning before she gets up, I'm off to work again. So I'm always getting her what she wants, and I'm always making sure the house is clean. How long is that relationship going to survive? The answer is not very long. Because our service can rip away from our relationship. The first love, when you get saved, if you've ever been truly saved, you are in love with Jesus Christ. He gave you the greatest gift ever. He gave you eternal life when you deserved eternal hell. If you don't realize that you deserved hell, then how can you be grateful for salvation? You have to realize that the only thing that's going to change your destiny when it comes to judgment day is the blood of Jesus Christ, nothing else. He is your first love. He, we love him only because he first loved us. So this church, they fell away. They were focusing on service and doing things for God. They forgot about their love for God. God always wants you to participate and work and wants you to work as if you're working for him even when you're going to your regular jobs even when you're going to provide for your family you go and you work as if it's for him you do everything to honor him but he also wants you personally he wants you to talk to him 
People always say, well, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to pray. Well, tell God that. It's okay to pray to God to say, I don't know how to pray, Lord. It's okay to talk to God and tell him, Lord, I've been having a terrible day. It's okay to tell him about your day. It's okay to tell him about your frustrations, to thank him for the good things you enjoy. It doesn't, everybody wants to make prayer into something always formal. Okay, everybody, let's sit down. Let's uh, get on our knees and let's, uh, okay, I'll go first and then you go and then you go. There is a time for that. Absolutely. There is a time for public prayer. But Jesus says, when you pray, go into your room, go into your closet, shut the door, get on your knees and talk to your father. Talk to your father. Do you remember when Jesus was praying in the garden, when he was having that relationship? He wasn't saying, our father who art in heaven. That's a great prayer. But what was he saying? He's saying, oh, Lord, please, please take this burden from me. Take this cup from me. If there's any other way to save these people, please don't make me drink from this cup but not my will, but yours be done. There is nothing wrong with opening your heart to Jesus, opening your heart to God through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, and talking. He wants that relationship with you. All the stuff I could buy for my wife won't count for anything if I don't spend time with my wife. All the things I could get my kids count for nothing if I don't sit down with my kids. All the stuff you do for Christ, all the Bible studies, all the outreaches, all the uh, donations, all the things you think you're doing, if you don't sit and talk and read your Bible, read the Word, talk with other Christians about our Lord, what is it going to count for? The answer is not very much. You don't want to put the cost of your love for Christ at the expense of service for Christ. Service for Christ is good but it's not as good as the relationship. So they had left their first love. Now, there's some examples of this throughout the Bible. So there was a story when Jesus was, uh, was here on earth where he came by to visit his friend Lazarus and his, their, his, their sisters, Mary and Martha. His sister, their Mary and Martha. Sisters, sorry. So that's in Luke chapter 10. So Martha was busy working. She was going to the kitchen. She was cooking, getting refreshments, getting stuff for everyone. And Mary just sat down at the feet of Jesus Christ. And Mary was sitting there, and Martha's like, what is going on? Like, Jesus, tell Mary, hey, why should I have to do all this work? Tell her to get up and to help me with all these, you know, serving everybody. And you know what Jesus said? She praised Mary. He said, Martha, Martha, you're troubled about so many things, but Mary has chosen the better part. God wants your devotion. He wanted devotion from the church of Ephesus. He wants devotion from me and you. Don't get tied up doing plays and working all these things if it's taking away from your personal time with Jesus Christ. We focus a lot on biblical doctrine. I have met some Christians who would rather argue day and night about the things we disagree between the denominations, and I'm interested in that stuff, but they don't want to spend 15 minutes praising the fact that Jesus saved us from our sins. We need to uh, know where we stand, know what we agree on, be united in the things we agree on, and the things we disagree on, as long as they're not salvation-related, we can discuss it. But it should never take away from our devotion and our communion with each other and with Jesus Christ. Um, so, I mean, i give you one more example, then we'll move on past this. And whenever we talk about King David, and we talk about King Solomon, King David was the third king of Israel. Some people consider him the second, but he was the third king of all Israel. And he actually was well-loved, but he was a terrible man in many ways. He broke all the Ten Commandments. He murdered a man so he could, because he got his wife, he got her, uh, the man he murdered's wife pregnant. Um, he had made all kinds of mistakes. Solomon, on the other hand, his son was extremely rich, extremely wise, extremely powerful. Now, he had tons of his own wives, and he wrote all these proverbs. But there was a difference between Solomon and there was a difference between David. David, despite all of his problems, he always had a relationship with God. Whereas Solomon, he wrote a big portion of your Old Testament. 
He wrote a number of books of your Old Testament, actually. But even though Solomon has all this wisdom and all this knowledge, his heart was not like the heart of David, the heart of a relationship with God. David was a bad person. I am a bad person. You are a bad person when it comes relative to Jesus Christ. You have broken his law. You need him. We all need him. Without him paying for our sins, we are desperately lost. But you see what David had and what we should all have is to talk with Jesus Christ, to thank him for forgiving us, to lay it all out just like David did. When you read the, the, the Proverbs of Solomon, you get some wisdom. But when you read the prayers of David, your heart breaks when he realizes how hurt he was that he hurt our Savior. So just remember, the New Testament, it verifies that David is praised. And Solomon, he's kind of offhandedly discussed. Talked about, oh, you know, Solomon with all of his riches doesn't look as nice as this field of the flower. But he talks about how David is, he was like, he acted like a king and a priest whenever it refers to Jesus eating in the, his disciples eating in the field. So again, we just see that God treasures relationships. We know in the Old Testament, Enoch, he walked with God and God took him. He was raptured before the flood, being a symbol, I believe, of the church. Um, we know that God revealed the future to the prophet Daniel, who was his beloved, the beloved prophet. We know he revealed the revelation to John, who's the beloved disciple. We see how God loves relationships, and he wants a relationship with you. He wants your heart, not your money. God has plenty of resources. He wants your time, not just church attendance. He wants you to have that relationship with him. Don't be more interested in how well the church service came together for the video production than you are in the fact of how it sounded to God. Worry more about how much it blesses God's heart and focus on your first love. So then we get to verse five. It says, remember, therefore, from where or from whence you have fallen, thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works. What was the first works? Love Jesus or else I will, re I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick from out of its place. So that's interesting. When a church drifts far from Jesus, far from the Bible, from God, they're no longer able to bear the light of the world. When it becomes so much more about the things you do and not your relationship with Jesus, you are incapable of showing light to the world. Think about that. This church did, did, did. And he's like, wow, I see your works. They're great. But you've left your first love. So your entire candlestick will be removed. A man who does nothing but works will not see heaven. If a man joins our church group, our church club, and they feed the poor they go and they build wheelchair ramps. They go sing Christmas carols. They hand out candy canes and tracts. And they die in their sins. Guess what? They still go to hell. A church full of works, but not of Jesus Christ, has no light at all. And I believe there are churches today that are full. They'll make you feel happy. They'll make you feel emotionally satisfied. You're going to be like, wow, this is great. Look at how much stuff is going on. But then as time grows on and you grow in your Christianity, you begin to feel like this church is somehow hollow. As you begin to look for that deeper relationship, you're going to see that it's missing. I'm not bashing any specific church, but realize that there are many churches that have all kinds of service, but very little Jesus. It's worse than no church at all. It makes people think they're going to heaven when they have no chance. Because if, they, if, if your church is not preaching to you, you are a sinner and you need a savior, then you need to find another church because that is the message that matters. All the other things we can agree or disagree on, but the only thing that takes us to heaven is the death and the shedding of Jesus Christ's blood for our sins. That is the gospel. He, was, he died for our sins. He was buried and he was resurrected again on the third day. That's the gospel. Do you believe he died for your sins? Make sure that your church is teaching you that. And if not, Talk to the pastor. See if they teach you. So anyway, 
it makes people so um we just love the lord our god with all our heart soul mind and strength and good works are great but you when you look the life the life of anyone in the new testament you always have to use the word of god it's more than works it's not just about living and being nice it's not about being a good person don't ever think that i say this a lot and i've repeated it a few times but the fact is there are so many christians people who have listened to these videos and i ask them are you going to heaven i hope so what do you mean you hope so well i'm a good person that is never the right answer that will not get you to heaven jesus died for your sins so what's jesus's advice to this church to remember where they have fallen and repent or to turn back to where you were. Otherwise, their candlestick is going to be completely removed. And not only are they going to be removed, they're going to be removed prematurely. He says, I will come quickly and remove your candlestick. Well, where is the church of the apostles today? Where is the original church? Well, it's gone. This church was supposed to love the Lord God with everything, but instead it became fixated on secondary things. We read about the church fathers, the early church, right? And we see that that's the church. Those are the people that came out of this church. And there is writing after writing after writing after writing about this doctrine and that doctrine and that doctrine and that doctrine. But what happens whenever the church comes under persecution? The church that's praised is the following church, Smyrna, not this church. The doctrine didn't matter. And this church was removed from the world. What does the Bible tell us about being the light in Isaiah 60? He says in verse 1, Arise and shine, for thy light is come, for the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Are you reflecting the glory of Jesus Christ? Are you reflecting the truth of Jesus Christ? Or are you more worried in what you do? We need the light of Jesus as our major focus. And the relationship with Jesus is what makes us shine the light. I don't want to keep going on and on about this. But in the Old Testament, whenever Moses would go and spend time with God, he would come out of the tabernacle after spending face-to-face -face time. And what would happen? His face would be so bright that people couldn't look at it. When you spend time in the presence of Jesus Christ, people can't deny the reflection of him in your life. So this church needed more of that. And then we see in verse 6, well, what's the good thing they still have? He says, but this thou hast. There's one thing that I'm really glad with, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. A lot of people want to say, oh, God doesn't hate anything. No, there's a number of things that God hates. And one of the things are the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now, a lot of people uh, wonder, who are the Nicolaitans? What did they teach? What did they, where did they go? Well, we don't have a lot of evidence, you know, in history books about who they were. But we have their names, the Nicolaitans. And we have the Nicolaitans being a term where Nikau, or N-I-C-A-O, it actually means to conquer or to overcome. And laos or laos, la laity, it means the common people, the laity of a church. You know, there's the clergy and the laity. This is the leaders of the common people or the overcomers or the conquerors of the, la of the common people. So it seems to be these people had a real focus in having the church have authority to give power to the clergy over the lay people. The fact is, biblically, Christians are the representatives of Jesus Christ. Christians are the priests and the kings, not certain Christians, all Christians. Jesus Christ is the one who has authority over us. When Jesus died, the veil in the temple was split because we all now have access to God through Jesus Christ. The church rejected those, this church rejected those who tried to say, no, the only people with access are the clergy. They're the ones that have power over you. Well, Jesus, he actually explained how his hierarchy would be in his church. He said that being the greatest means serving the others. He went and he washed his disciples' feet. The God of the universe came to flesh in human form, got on his hands and knees, and washed the dirt off of his disciples' feet. 
and he is the always will be the greatest among us. Having clergy and authority and power and being served by the lay people, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with church leadership. I'm saying that having this idea of, okay, you guys serve me and do what I say, that's not how Jesus did it. He taught them the truth, and then he served them. Jesus tells his disciples, now some people take it literally, they say we should wash each other's feet, but more specifically, more, uh, ap more uh, applicable is that he's saying we ought to love one another and serve one another in everything, not just in washing the dirt off our feet. We aren't wearing sandals anymore. We aren't running around with on dusty roads. It doesn't make a lot of sense to say, okay, you have to just wash my feet, although that's a great way to show that I'm willing to serve you. But he means that when you need help, come by. When I'm building a treehouse, I got a couple of friends that come by and they help and they, they're serving me when I did nothing to deserve it. Um, Peter even verifies this. Uh, the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 5.1, he says that no man has a right over the Lord God's heritage or those who have accepted him. So he's talking to the elders of the church, those who would be considered the clergy. He says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, he says, the elders which are among you, you will exhort, you and you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So I'm, I'm very pleased with the elders. I want them to be lifted up. He tells the elders, feed the flock which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint. Don't force them to sit there and, and uh, serve you but let them do it willingly, not for filthy lucre, don't do it for money or for any benefit, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage. Don't assume that you have authority or mastery over them, but being examples to the flock. Leaders of the church are to be our examples. They're to be servants for us, for the people, for the lay people. Elders are ministers. Minister means to serve. Absolutely. Don't misunderstand a word I'm saying. You need to respect and honor and pray for your pastor, your minister, your priest, whatever church you're in, the leadership of your church. You should be praying for them that they follow in God's direction. Respect them, but also understand they're not your father. They're your brother. They're your brother and your sister in the faith. We are to lead each other to Christ. And let me tell you this, your pastor needs your prayer, needs your support. They need you to pray for them. They need you. If you found a word in the Bible to share with them, you share it with them. You tell them. Um, so then we go on and uh, this church. Now we got to remember this early church ran into problems as we see here and their candlestick is at the verge of being removed. He says, and a lot of people, they put this stock in the early church fathers. And I'm not saying they were bad. A lot of them were good. And a lot of their teachings are good. But when we look at the early church fathers, the writings of uh, Irenaeus and all these different ones, we got to understand these were people that Christ wasn't pleased with if we're to understand with the letters to Ephesus. I'm not saying what that makes what they're saying wrong. Many of what much of what they say is true. But the point is, your pastor is not perfect. They weren't perfect. I'm not perfect. Only the word of God is perfect. Only the law of the Lord is perfect. Only Jesus Christ is perfect. Use your Bibles. Read and know your word. Your church has something to learn from these letters. I have something to learn from these letters. You have something to learn from these letters. There are very few churches, actually two mentioned, that don't have anything negative written about them. And we're going to get to those over the next few weeks. Um, yeah, sorry, it's going to be slow going. But uh the point being, the churches that think they're doing well, God's not very pleased with. But the ones who think they're doing horribly or suffering and being killed, Jesus has a lot of good things to say to them. And then the last part, the last verse here says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So the prompt, now notice one thing that the promise to the overcomer is the second half of that verse. So, so the, the letter ends, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then it says the promise to the overcomer. That is important. We'll come back to that in a minute. 
we also have to notice that Jesus promises this church that if they don't repent, he's going to come back quickly and remove their candlestick. So there's no mention of the coming tribulation on the world, no mention of the coming judgment of the world, but there's going to be a judgment on this church where they are removed. But those who overcome are going to eat of the garden in the garden of pleasure, which is what the word paradise means. The paradise of God, the garden of pleasure of God. Adam and Eve, they enjoyed it. We were asked earlier, is this the same tree of life? Well, the tree of life, I believe, is a literal tree, but I believe figuratively as well that it is Jesus Christ. We are going to be in the presence of Jesus Christ and have eternal life. While Adam and Eve could enjoy eternal life, they had to eat of the tree of life to obtain it. But our tree of life is Jesus Christ. And even if Adam and Eve were capable of eating from that tree, even as sinners, they would live forever. But that's why they were forbidden from coming back into the garden with these cherubim, with a sword that goes every way. Because the fact is, even as sinners, we too can have eternal life if we eat from the tree of life, also known as the bread of life, also known as Jesus Christ, the Almighty God. Praise God. Adam and Eve, they enjoyed paradise, but they blew it. But Jesus restored paradise to anyone who will accept it. And with his restored paradise, there will never be any sin or sorrow as we read about this tree of life in Revelation 22, which who knows when we'll get there. Um, so the overcomer, the word overcomer, people say, well, what's an overcomer? How do you overcome? Well, the overcomer is explained to us in 1 John chapter 5, verse 5. And 1 John chapter 5, verse 5 says, who is he that overcometh the world? but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Have you accepted that Jesus is the Son of God? In which case, he did not lie when he said that he came down to die for your sins. That when he said you need his blood, you have to eat the bread of life and drink the blood of Christ. Now, not literally, but again, spiritually, that you have to enter the door. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Do you believe that he's the Son of God and all these things were true? If you do, then you are an overcomer. And as an overcomer, you will eat from the paradise. You'll eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Now, again, notice that the promise to the overcomer comes after the close of the letter. That is significant. Okay. So you need to listen to what God says to the churches. So what are the main points we take away personally here? God wants your devotion. Doctrine is good, details are fine, but God wants your devotion and your relationship. When you get up in the morning, do you talk to your father? When you go to bed at night, do you talk with him? When you're frustrated, do you talk with him? When you're angry, when you're sad, when you're happy, are you talking with him? David was a total failure, but a complete success in the eyes of God because of his relationship. What is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do work, but do it because of your love. Don't do it instead of your love. Legalism isn't going to get you anywhere. You may be right, but you may not be loving. And Jesus says it's our love for him and our love for one another that's going to draw people to him. This church represents the Apostles' Church from the time of Jesus till about 180 or so, 100, 188 uh, AD. Now, John was the last apostle that was living. Jesus says he's the one holding the star. So just like Paul had warned Ephesus, hey, don't listen to the false teachers. And he talked to Timothy, who was one of the leaders of this church. He said, don't listen to false teachers. It turns they focused way too much on preventing false teachers that they lost their love of the Messiah. They lost their love of the word of God. Now, remember, this is the second, maybe third generation that John is speaking to. The church started in about 33 A.D., ish. And we are now about 70 years later. The generation of believers that were there had come and gone. The next generation had come and some of them were gone. We we're maybe a third generation in. So this church was beginning to lose its love for Christ. And of course, those who overcome will still be, of course, saved. So Jesus told John, now this is again, why does it matter how the chapters close? Why does it matter what happens after? Well, we know from chapter one 
Jesus told John to write down everything he had seen, which was the vision of Christ. Then he says, write down all the things that are the things that are currently existing. And here's where these churches fit in. And then he says, write the things which shall happen hereafter, where the word metatauta means after these things are done, after these things are completed. So in the beginning of chapter four, he says, after this, or after these, or um, after these things, it's, let me just read the actual verse in Revelation four. It says in verse one, after this, I looked, so after this, metatata, after this, well, after what? After he heard the letters to the churches, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me. A trumpet's talking to him? That's kind of weird. It's almost like a trumpet is calling him to come to heaven. It says, come up hither, where, and I will show you things which must be hereafter or after these things. After what things? after the things described in Revelation 2 and 3. This is important to understand. You have to understand that after the events of Revelation 2 and 3, John is told the things which will happen. Well, guess what happens ever after Revelation 2 and 3? We see the beginning of a seven-year period called the Tribulation, of which three and a half years is called the Great Tribulation. It, now, when I say seven years, it's at least seven years. It not, doesn't have to be limited to, but it at least includes seven years. So today we're living in a time called the church age. The Bible refers to it in a variety of ways. The time of the Gentiles is one way you see about it in the Old Testament. Paul talks about the fullness of the Gentiles, meaning that that time is completed. We read about this present dispensation that a dispensationalist, which the word is in the Bible, some people don't believe that, and for those of you who don't know what a dispensation is, that's the idea that God worked in different ways at different times in the Bible. So that means that God's grace is always there. It's always by grace, but with Adam and Eve, eternal life wasn't by accepting Jesus at the cross or by making sacrifices. It was by not eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and eating from the tree of life. And of course, during the time of um, Israel and the time, you know, there's some time in between where there was no temple, where everybody would make a sacrifice on their own whenever they sinned. And then, of course, there was the time of the temple where it was forbidden to make a sacrifice on your own. You had to believe and do all this work of sacrificing and accepting that you're responsible for your sin, but you're transferring that to an animal. And then now we live with the knowledge of realizing the only thing that ever really pays for sin is the blood of Christ. But there's a time coming where it becomes dangerous and difficult to be a Christian. Right now, you accept Jesus Christ, and you're saved. And in your heart, you've accepted him, and no one can take that away. But there's a time coming where it's going to be dangerous in the sense that you could lose your head. And it is coming. The fact is, we live in this dispensation or time period of grace or the dispensation of the church. So we need to see what happens if we want to know how does the church, how do we know the church age has ended? Well, if all the events described in Revelation 2 and 3 have been completed, then we know we can get into Revelation 4. So we are going to see what happens to each church in these two chapters. Well, I'll give you a little summary here. So in regards to this church, we see that the promise to the overcomer, again, comes after the close of the letter. That only happens for the first three churches. The last four churches, the promise to the overcomer, is before the close of the letter. Did Jesus slip up? Of course not. There is a purpose for every way that things are written. The first three churches are in some way different than the last four churches. So this church, right? Remember, this church, what does Jesus promise? Is if you don't repent, I'm going to come quickly and remove your candlestick. Well, he's going to come quickly. Well, he we know he's coming, but it's to other churches, he doesn't say he's going to come quickly, except for one other. He tells this church he's going to come quickly or soon to remove their candlestick if they don't repent. Okay, well, we know the apostles' church has been removed. That church is gone from the earth. The early church fathers, all of their history— all the nothing grew out of them except we led into the church of Smyrna, the second church. That's the church we'll talk about next week. 
that church is promised death and suffering and misery and that they will not survive they will all be killed so that second church is not going to last just like the first church candlestick was taken away the second church is not going to last to the return of christ then we have the third church and the third church he talks with that church that if you i'm going to come quickly to you and i'm going to fight against you with the sword of my mouth so he's also coming early and he's actually going to personally fight against the third church remember those first three churches they're the ones that have the promise to the overcomer after the close of the letter well what's interesting is the discussion of how he's coming changes for the last four churches so whenever we get to the fourth church he tells them he says that to the first ones that you're going to be cast and when i come you're going to be cast into great tribulation so this church is going to survive until the, the rapture of Jesus Christ. And they are going to go into something called the Great Tribulation. Now, who was it that coined the phrase the Great Tribulation? Jesus Christ. He's the first one to use that term in the book of Matthew, as recorded. And then he is also the one that records it here. Um, and then, you, so he says, but some of you who repent and hold fast to what you have, they're not going to have to go through that. So the events that are going to occur before the events of chapter 4 is the return of Christ for the fourth church and leaving some behind and taking some. Then we get to the fifth church, the church of Sardis. And he says to them that some of you have not stained your clothes and others of you have. But I'm going to show up to you like a thief in the night. You're not going to expect it. Well, so that church, again, Jesus talks about returning. So by the time we get to chapter 4, the events of chapter 2 and 3 have happened. That means Jesus has returned for some of his church by the time we reach chapter 4. And then we get to the sixth church. And to that church, he says, yeah, because you have been faithful, I'm going to keep you from the hour of temptation that's coming on the whole world. So again, that church will have been raptured by the time you reach chapter 4. And then to the seventh church, he says, you're so lukewarm you nauseate me. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. So that church, again, he's returned and he's left that church behind. If you ever heard the term left behind, that's going to become very relevant here. The point being, by the time you end Revelation 2 and 3, once all those events have been completed, that means the rapture has occurred and those who have left behind are left behind to endure what's about to come in Revelation 4. And to every church, the promise is the same. The overcomer gets to avoid the terrible fate that's coming to this world. So make sure that you have accepted Jesus Christ. And I hope all this makes sense to you guys. I hope we were able to follow through everything here. We're going to wrap it up there. We went a little long tonight. I apologize. But I hope that kind of puts into perspective this early church of the apostles, the church of the Ephesians, and also sees how we can apply it to our lives to have more devotion and more relationship with Jesus and then worry about the doctrine and the activities and the work. So praise God. Thank you. I'm going to say goodbye to our Facebook crew and uh, hope that, you're, that you guys enjoyed this. And then we'll uh, say goodnight to our Zoom crew here in a few minutes. God bless you guys. Have a great night. Thanks for joining us.